when you go to the investigation the serum c3 levels these are reduced in 90% by first one week and it generally recovers by itself by two months okay so you do c3 levels it is reduced in 90% of patients okay so this is the alternative pathway and it recovers by two months then uh, like i told cryoglobulins anti c1q antibodies and rheumatoid factor can be positive in one third of patients in the acute disease generally in impetigo psgn occurs the time period is 2 to 4 weeks okay but in pharyngeal infection or urti the psgn occurs by 7 to 10 days this is in contrast to ige nephropathy which is synpharyngitic here generally there is a time lag so infection occurs antibody has to form then the antigen and antibody has to go deposit in the kidney so this time time lag is what causes what causes this lag for the glomerulonephritis presentation and that it's more for impetigo like how the nephritogenic stains were more in number like that you can remember so it's 2 to 4 weeks in impetigo whereas it's 7 to 10 days in pharyngeal infection okay now other infections other testing you can do is to prove what happens to the uh, what uh, has infected the patient okay so if you do aso titer that is anti streptococcal titers more than 65% of patients will have this after throat infection if you want for impetigo then you have to do anti dna b okay so this has been asked as question since our um, uh, md need time right so aso titer is more for throat infection whereas anti dna b is more for impetigo cases okay and there is a panel called streptozyme panel which will check four important antibodies which is anti dna b anti hyaluronidase aso and anti streptokinase these are present in more than 80% of patients so you don't know what is causing the infection there is no evident then you send the streptozyme panel which has aso anti dna b along with the two other streptococcal antibodies that is anti hyaluronidase and anti streptokinase antibodies and sorry this will be seen in more than 80% of patients okay now once the child comes to you you have to know that renal biopsy is not indicated in all because if you give supportive therapy then this is a self limiting disease then in whom renal biopsy is indicated like in any other condition if there are atypical features then renal biopsy will be indicated so what are the atypical features child having nephrotic range proteinuria like we discuss the incidence of nephrotic syndrome is only less than 2% so if it is occurring then this child will require biopsy because it can be some other decrease c3 levels more than a month so generally i told that for 2 weeks it will be decreased and by a month it is going to recover so if it doesn't recover by a month then we have to consider renal biopsy next is increasing renal dysfunction in 2 weeks okay so think the child comes and creatinine is normal but creatinine goes on elevating then you have to do biopsy for this age if the age is higher for example adults then oliguria is present for more than a week like how complement starts recovering within a week's time even oliguria should start recovering within a week's time if it doesn't happen and no clear history of preceding infection that is you are not able to localize a impetigo or a respiratory tract infection so based on uh, let, let us divide this chart into based on history physical examination investigations okay history if there is no infection history that you are getting from the patient or if the age is adult age if the child is having oliguria more than a week okay so these are the features on history that will help us show that this is an atypical case and it might require biopsy second is labs in labs if there is increased serum creatinine for more than 2 weeks okay and decreased c3 levels for more than 4 weeks and there is nephrotic range proteinuria okay so you understood the laboratory and the clinical parameters that will help you in deciding whether renal biopsy is required in a child with psgn now when you go to renal biopsy you see light microscopy immunofluorescence and electron microscopy so in light microscopy 
like you can see in this picture, there's going to be diffuse proliferation, okay? So there is going to be diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis and there is going to be mesangial hypercellularity. So you know that every glomeruli is made up of multiple endothelium. Then you know GBM is covering like this and in between whatever is there is the mesangium, okay? So there can be glomerular hypercellularity. So imagine multiple cells here. There can be mesangial hypercellularity also. And base outside GBM is the podocyte, right? So here also if there is proliferation, then it is going to be crescents. So everywhere there is going to be so much inflammation that there is going to be proliferation. So there can be endothelial vessel or it can be in the mesangium, it can be outside crescents, okay? Rare is MPGN or extensive crescents. Crescents are generally small and it is seen in only 50% of patients. So, immunofluorescence, what is going to be there? There is going to be C3 and immunoglobulin, right? So, dominant C3 staining you are going to see wherever antibodies are deposited and immunoglobulin G and IgM is less frequent. Now, you know what you are going to see. What you are not going to see is IgA and C1Q. So, that is very important, okay? IgA you see in one specific type of IRG and I will come to that. But in PSGN, you are going to see only C3 and immunoglobulin G. So, this antibodies are arranged in certain pattern. So, this has been asked as question previously. First pattern is called starry sky pattern. So, what happens is like we discussed, there is going to be capillary wall. There is going to be GBM and there is going to be mesangium, right? So, if the immunoglobulins are located in the capillary wall and in the mesangium. So, imagine if this is dark, you are only going to see stars, right? You are going to see these things as stars. So, it is called starry sky pattern. So, immune deposits found in the capillary wall and in the mesangium. Next is garland, it is not protein, sorry, garland pattern. So, what is garland pattern is? Here we know is the GBM and here you know is the epithelium, right? So, here antibodies are going to be deposited. This, see in real there is not going to be this much space. Okay, again and again I am telling because this I am explaining so that you get the idea of that glomerular basement membrane and all these things. Okay. So, um, there is going to be sub-epithelial hums and once this sub-epithelial hums are deposited, you see how the deposition is. It is like a garland, right? So, this is called as garland pattern. So, sub-epithelial hump that are deposits are called as garland pattern. So, last to disappear are mesangial C3 deposits and not seen at Ig and C1Q. So, the starry sky pattern are nothing but what is seen in the glomerular capillary wall and in the mesangium. But garland pattern is nothing but the sub-epithelial depositions of antigen and antibody. Okay. Now, electron microscopy again you are going to see. Uh, Subepithelial hump deposits, which are typical of PSGN, and it is seen because of streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxin B. And capillary basement membrane reflects over the mesangium. So, this area, wherever the capillary basement membrane reflects over the mesangium, this area you are going to see more antibodies. More antibodies. Okay, so this is what you are going to see in electron microscopy. So, so far in renal biopsy, we found that immunofluorescence is very important. Okay. Now, differential diagnosis is C3GN because I told plenty C3 deposits are going to be there in the kidney. So, it becomes C3GN. PSGN is a self-limiting disease. Okay. And here what happens is C3 is dominant. In investigation, here C3 is dominant. Here C3 need not be dominant in PSGN, okay. So, that is how you differentiate and PSGN generally recovers. These do not recover and will have C3 uh, deposition in the kidney for a long time. Other one is anchor vasculitis, uh, which can be a close differential because these patients can have crescents and also they are going to uh, have anchor antibodies positive presenting as glomerulonephritis. But anchor vasculitis is mostly posse immune, that is you are not going to find immune deposits in the kidney, okay. Now, this picture showing the, this is the light microscopy showing proliferation. There is endothelial proliferation and mesangial proliferation. This is the 
starry sky pattern that is seen in the mesangium and in the capillary wall and this you can see is the garland pattern this is the sub epithelial humps that are deposited in uh, the sub epithelial space leading to garland pattern of immunofluorescence okay now what happens to these patients in one month they generally undergo resolution of clinical symptoms and esrd is seen in less than 1% of patients okay and some patients might have mild proteinuria and microscopic hematuria for one year this is important because the child you think comes to you by one month the child is fully recovered the complement becomes normal renal functions are normal and you send them home then on follow up you notice that there is some trace proteinuria there is some 5 to 6 rbcs there is no need to panic it is common and it can last up till one year okay only children who have nephrotic presentation that is less than 2% of patients will have poor prognosis